tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O sin. Everyone else will open your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter and chapter 3. I mentioned, mentioned the, uh, during announcements that choir practice will be at 5.15 this evening instead of 5 o'clock. And so that's an extra 15 minute nap. So there you go. 2 Peter chapter 3. And that will make it so that you can come and hear Nick preach. Before I read our text this morning, I want to qualify the sermon, and I've used the word qualify quite a, quite a bit, so I guess I could just say anything that I preach that you disagree with, Charlie will prove. And so, <laughs> that's the Charlie statement today. He's got friends here today, so it's um, even more fun to give him a hard time. And by the way, if you haven't given Charlie a hard time, my recommendation for you would be to have him over to dinner and just kind of let him have it for a few hours. And we ought to spread it out a little bit. Some of us are having too much fun. And so you got to, we've got to uh, share him a little bit. And he's available uh, Thursdays. He's off every Thursday evening. And so if you'd like to take Charlie to dinner and give him a hard time, Thursday night is the best time for it. And so there's a little plug in for Charlie. This is Give Charlie a Chance Month. And so Second Peter chapter 3. I'm going to stop being silly and I want to qualify... Uh, I, uh, Stu say a couple things about our uh, message that we're going to preach this morning. First of all, I want to explain why I'm going to preach 
the message that we're going to preach this morning. I'm not a topical preacher, and very rarely uh, do I preach any kind of a reactive message. And I would have to say that this morning, the message that I'm going to preach is reactive. It has to do with current events. And I uh, think that a couple of things that really have governed my preaching and will continue to do so, and that is that I try to be biblically relevant and not culturally relevant. You see, culture comes and goes and always changes, but God is unchanging and so is His Word. Amen. And there is a philosophy in churches today that tries to be with the culture, and they try to stay with the culture. And the problem is that the culture, first of all, is constantly changing. Second of all, it's worldly. It's not of God. It's the things of the world. And so I strive to uh, just preach and teach the Word of God because it is relevant to God. And if there's a, if there's a gap in relevance between uh, our culture and God's Word, then the thing that needs to change is the culture. And so we need to be conformed to Him, conformed to His Word. Matter of fact, that's the job of the Christian is being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Everyone who's <laughs> ever been saved is predestinated to be conformed to the image of His Son. Brother Chris mentioned that in Sunday school this morning in Culture of the Cross. That the Bible doctrine of predestination is biblical, but it's just not in the context of salvation. It's in the context of a Christian's life. And every time you see it mentioned, it is in the context of a person who is saved. God's plan and His intention is for you to be like Jesus. Wonderful promise of the Scripture that anybody who is in Christ is not only a new creature, but he can be everything that God wants him to be. You ever met somebody that it seemed as though because of their circumstances or their environment or because of their past, they didn't seem like they're on equal footing? And I don't know how many times people have told me, well, that's easy for you to say, Pastor Price. I mean, you've had the perfect life, you know, and, uh, you know, everything went right for you. But, I mean, look at the mess that I got saved out of and look at what's going on in my life. I just want to say I agree with them. I have had the perfect life. God's been very good to me. I, don't, I wouldn't say that, um, I wouldn't contradict that at all. But I think that everybody who has life has been given perfect life. God didn't stunt anybody when he created them. And if he's given you something to overcome by his grace, it's because of a special calling in your life and because of a special opportunity to serve him. And so it's a wonderful, wonderful Bible doctrine that we ought to understand and teach. But I want to preach a message this morning. And I'm going to preach a topical message for two reasons. One, we're going to begin a study in 1 Corinthians. Uh, not next week, but the week after. And I just didn't think it'd be good to start and then have someone else preach next Sunday and kind of interrupt uh, that, that uh, preaching through the books like we normally would do. And so that would be one reason for it. And the second one is, I made a mistake last week and watched the news a little bit. And, <laughs> and so it vexed my soul. I just want to be honest with you. I've got a burden of heaviness on me. And I suppose you can guess what it is. It's not because the Miami Heat beat the Chicago Bulls. I did find that out in the news. Um, but there are two major events going on in the news in the news this week, and one of them has to do with the fact that the Miami Heat are in the playoffs and uh, are trying hard, right, Jonathan? Maybe they'll, is it tonight they're going to play a game? They're going to play a game tonight. Somebody tell me tomorrow what happened. I'm looking forward to anticipating finding out how that goes. I won't spend my time finding out for myself, but uh, normally what I do, you folks know this, with regard to the news is somebody always tells me what's going on, so I don't waste the time finding out for myself. Usually people say, Pastor, what do you think about this that's going on? I say, well, tell me about it. I don't know anything about it. And to be honest, it's because the news depresses me and it discourages me as a Christian and distracts me. But this last week, I did make the mistake of watching the news a little bit. But I didn't, uh, that isn't really where it bothered me the most. Brother Tony sent me. And Tony, Tony, are you over there? I'm here. You get up. I can't see you at all. You're distracting me. Brother Tony, <laughs> yeah, it's like a jack in the box. It's Tony in the hole. <laughs> Brother Tony sent me a, a YouTube video of our church last, last week. We had our five-year anniversary service, and he uh, sent me a clip. And Tony always does this with fear and trepidation because he always knows I'm not going to like something about it and tell him to take it down. And So he sent it to me, and I, I went and watched it, and I saw a comment that somebody had made on one of our videos. And Tony riles atheists. He takes my preaching and makes atheists mad with it or something. They're always mad. And I, I clicked on something where some atheists were going to the Creation Museum in Kentucky and uh, going there to find out the other side, the, other, the perspective from the other side. And uh, I, I'll tell you, tell you a little bit more about one of the things that I saw in there. It really bothered me, but the big news, of course, that you know is going on is that the rapture was supposed to happen yesterday. Uh, Jesus was supposed to return and Day of Judgment was yesterday. And it's funny, I've made a lot of jokes about it, made light of it. You know, we... I uh, understand from Mark chapter 13 that Jesus himself does not know the day that he's going to come, neither do the angels in heaven. 
And of course, he, the scripture makes very plain that no man knows the day and the time. But our text today deals with that matter, deals with what is going on uh, with those matters. And it is, um, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but it is something that we as Christians have had a lot of damage done, not by the media, but by individuals that claim the name of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I don't know the heart of any person. I don't know whether Harold Camping is saved or he's not. Um, I, I think, I don't really know anything about him, honestly. I don't listen to the radio. I don't listen to Christian radio. That's just as depressing, I think, as <laughs> watching the news in our area. Uh, so I, I couldn't tell you uh, exactly what's a lot about Harold Camping. I just say he's a heretic and you ought to avoid him. There are many individuals that have been saved that have gone astray. They have gone aside from the truth. Matter of fact, if you study the word apostasy in the New Testament, you study the falling away, you know falling away implies not that a person never was saved, but that they have deliberately moved doctrinally into a dangerous position of being uh, preaching something that is against Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, remember what Paul's warning was? He said, go we, or anyone, or an angel from heaven, preach to you a gospel that is not what you've received. You mark that person. And there are warnings in almost every one of the books of the New Testament that are not, or in, in particular the epistles, there's a warning in every one of the epistles about false doctrine. You know where the danger of false doctrine is? It's danger uh, that Christians, that people that are believers will preach and teach it. Um, I mentioned this morning there's a heaviness, and I think it's partly a result of myself. I've, been, I've just been burdened about it. I, th I think that what has been done this last week, there's people have tried to look at the positive. You know, folks are talking about the rapture. No, honestly, folks, what's happened is it's given scoffers a place to say, where is the promise of his coming? It's what's happened in this last week. Now, can God take anything? Hey, brother, you're all right. Just You can come sit down over here or whatever. That's fine. Yeah, you, that, it's, it's all right. Just, just take, it, take a seat wherever you feel comfortable. Um, scoffers will scoff. Is that not so? Scorners scorn, scoffers scoff, fools mock. That's their job. That's what they do. But I just want to say something that I, watching just some news last week, saw some people that I think are really going to be hurt by this dangerous doctrine. And so let's read our text this morning. We want to look at it from a biblical perspective, and I hope that we'll be equipped as a result of it to know how to give an answer and so that we could be a help to the lost. I don't want to talk about them today. I want to talk about us. So it's, that's one of the reasons I try not to be reactive. I don't think it's helpful to, for me to preach about why someone in some other church is wrong about something. I think it's helpful for us to know what it is in our lives that needs to be changed so we can be conformed to the image of Christ. And so we'll try to make that our focus this morning, but I do want to com confront and combat some things that are doctrinal error in our message today. Okay, I think that's enough qualification before we preach. Now, uh, we're going to read the text, and then we're going to ask for the Lord's help. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1, the scripture says this, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of a remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire, against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now, because we don't have time to look all the way down. Let's read verse 8, and then, if you will, let's look down to verse, uh, verses 14 through 16. So look at verse 8 with me in 2 Peter 3. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. And, of course, we know the Scripture there, the Lord's not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness. And I don't mean to make light of that verse. It's an important passage of scripture, but for sake of time, let's look down to verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, that's a conclusion word, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless, 
and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. I want to preach today a message entitled The Danger of False Doctrine, The Danger of False Doctrine. And you could, you could phrase it a lot of different ways, or you could call it the danger of bad theology or ignorance. And so uh, let's pray. And I want to ask that the, through the message today, God would do a couple of things. I would want to ask that, first of all, He would provide us with answers that could help people that are lost. And secondly, I would ask that God would uh, remove for me a lot of a burden that's been placed upon me to somehow trumpet the truth. And it's, it bothers me that so many individuals are proclaiming and spreading things that are damaging to the cause of Christ for their own personal profit. But yet Christians are standing by and saying nothing. I don't feel as though I need to combat what Christians are doing, but there are people that are going to hell and they need the truth. And they're making decisions that are, that are going to destroy them. If they're saved, they'll destroy them as a Christian. And they are uh, believing things that will hurt them in a, in a very, very dangerous way. And so we want to look at it from the Scripture. And I don't mean to bring a heaviness on our service this morning or anything like that, but I'm burdened about it. It really bothers me. And so I want to ask that the Lord will, through this message today, remove the burden or give us a vision for what we can do about it. Or, and secondly, that He'll equip us as saints. Heavenly Father, help us today for the things that we need in our lives to be equipped to serve You. Lord, I pray that today that there wouldn't be any doubt or confusion in the part of believers. God, I pray that today, because of what man has done to cause individuals to worship and believe him over your word, that individuals would somehow be spared because of your long suffering from the consequences of unbelief. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be able to preach this passage of Scripture to the lost so that we could be a help to individuals that don't know Jesus. We pray in his name. <coughs> Amen. I'm bothered not because Harold Camping is a big joke. I think I, I you know, honestly, when people uh, just a while back started asking, have you seen these billboards and want to know about it and telling who it was? I just laughed about it. I think, it, I honestly, I've, I've today thought of a million, you know, we've missed the rapture jokes. I'm concerned about all the people that are missing here this morning. and it, I'm not concerned that they're missing. I'm concerned that I'm the one that missed it, you know. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, if they're not here this morning, Brother Al Miller called this morning and he was sick and his family couldn't come. And so um, he didn't make the rapture either. Uh, but the other folks that are missing, you know, I say, well, you know, <laughs> I, I shouldn't make light of it. But there's, there's a humorous aspect, isn't there, to this mockery that individuals have made. I want to ask, first of all, I don't know the hearts of any person. I try not to try to do that. There are a couple things that I don't meddle with or interfere with. I do not try to know things that only God can know. I try to make it a habit of realizing, it could, is that something only God could know? There are a lot of preachers that try to figure out whether people that say they're saved are actually saved. They look at their life and they say, well, there's sin in their life. I don't know how they could be saved. Well, I do. I know how they could be saved. They're wicked. And they live in a sinful body of sinful flesh. And I don't question if they understand the gospel. They understand that Jesus Christ is the only way for salvation. And they've trusted Christ for, as their Savior. I don't try to know whether they're saved or not. I believe them. God's Spirit, God knows. They know. And He'll reveal it to them. And so it's not something that I have to spend my ministry trying to preach to convince them that they're, that they're lost so they can get saved. If they understand the gospel and they receive Christ as their Savior, I believe God saved them. If not, they know they lied and they know they're unsaved. And so God can deal with that work. In other words, that's something I don't mess with. I don't go, uh, you know, you'll notice I don't oftentimes preach messages that try to convince people that think they're saved that they're lost. Now, if you think you're saved this morning for any other reason than that Jesus Christ became your sin and that your sin was placed upon him, and He is offering you the opportunity to have His righteousness placed upon you because of the shed blood, because of atonement, because of, uh, because of sacrifice, because of propitiation, because of substitution, of His righteousness in our place uh, in, for our sin and our sin for His righteousness in the payment, the fact that Jesus Christ paid for our sins. If you think that salvation is for any other reason than that, then friend, then you're not saved. But let me just say that if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, the work of the cross by faith, you've asked God to save you, then that's what's necessary. And I don't meddle with that. I don't try to know it. I also don't try to know uh, what the motives behind different people are for why they do what they do. 
But let me just say to you that when I heard that a man was again for the second time leading individuals into apostasy by claiming that they're that he knew the date of the rapture and the hour of it and what was going to come as a result of it because the Holy Spirit told him so. I knew two things. One, that he blasphemed God's Holy Spirit. That's a blasphemy of God's Spirit to claim that God's Holy Spirit has done something that he did not do or to claim that something he did do was the work of a devil. The Scripture says that that's blasphemy. And so I knew that that was so. I don't have to judge the man to know that so. I'm very clear on what the Bible says about the rapture and about the coming of Jesus. And I know the rapture is not in the Bible, but the taking away, the snatching up, the coming of Jesus, it's in the Bible and the, the, the uh, principles of it are taught very, very specifically and very, very plainly. And so I knew that when that happened, that the motive behind it was not doctrinal truth. The motive behind it was something else. And it's not very hard to look at Harold Camping and his quote-unquote ministry, which is not. It's fleecing of innocent people. I, it's not hard for me to look at that and, and to, to be able to you know, use the brain that God gave me and say there's a motive here besides helping people. What do you think the motive of a person who has a 115 to $117 million ministry is uh, in purchasing billboards across the country and gathering a huge following unto himself? Money. Money. Now, I, you know, he's old enough. You'd think he'd be looking. Honestly, I just, I'm just thinking, if I were in his perspective, he's in his 80s, right? If I were him, I would be looking at being ready to meet the Lord. Matter of fact, that's what every Christian ought to do. That's the business of every Christian is being prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ. So I don't have a problem with him planning to be preparing for the coming of Christ, but I promise you um, that the fact that Harold Camping has scheduled for all his employees to be at work on Monday is an evidence that money is his motivation, not the coming of Jesus Christ. You can't take it with him. <laughs> no, you can't take it with you. But he has stolen people's money. There's no question about that. There are individuals, and this is what really, I guess, gave me a great heaviness. Two things yesterday, and I'll, I'll tell you what they were. There was, uh, there was a, one of the news anchors, and I don't remember him. I don't know whether it was CNN, CBS, NBC, or some of those other ones. I think it wasn't Fox News. But it was one of the news places that was reporting on the rapture, and there was a lady whose birthday was to be yesterday, and this was on Friday, and she was in Manhattan. And there was a man there who was just as sincere as he could possibly be, I think, as much as I could judge someone's heart. He's sincere enough to put his pocketbook behind what he said he believed. And that's pretty sincere, I think, in my opinion. Okay, and so he had a sign that was saying Doomsday to, on Friday or whatever it was, and he got interviewed by this lady whose birthday was to be on Doomsday. And uh, she interviewed him, and she asked him, uh, you know, you must really believe this because you've told me that you've invested the majority of your retirement into paying for promotion of all of this, and what's going to happen? What will happen? What will you do if on Saturday the Lord doesn't return? And his answer was, it's going to happen. I don't, have, I don't have a response for if it doesn't happen. Now, something similar to that, I, uh, I'm messing with uh, one of Tony's atheists. I wasn't messing with looking at one of their things where they went to the Creation Museum in Kentucky, which I understand is a wonderful ministry. They went there as scoffers to mock creation. And there was a man that was part of them and as they were making their funny comments about making making fun of people that believe that there was no evolution uh, and and that believe in creation they were talking about you know the order of events and laughing about how uh, God created the world and the flood and all these things in order and this man one of the men that had been a former Christian before they went into the museum one of the things they did was they identified themselves in what they had been before they became an atheist and, of course, everyone one becomes an atheist. You study Romans chapter 1, you'll understand very clearly that God didn't make any atheists. He didn't create any atheists. Individuals did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And so they made a choice of unbelief. They chose not to receive Jesus. They chose not to believe in God. And they chose to worship the creature more than the creator, and more specifically to worship themselves and their own intellect. Instead of worshiping God, they made a choice to become atheists. So before their conversion to atheism, which is what they admitted, on camera, they told what they were, and this guy was, I think, a Lutheran or something like that. I'm not sure. But they were interviewing, and they were asking, you actually believed in creation before? He's like, no, 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 no. He said, he said, I never believed in creation. He said, I wasn't one of the Christians that believed in creation before I became an atheist. And my thought on that was that, obviously, you didn't believe in creation. And obviously, you did take what you believed and made an honest assessment. The fact is, if you believe in evolution, you cannot believe in the Bible and you cannot believe in God. There are contradiction. If you're honest about what you believe, the contradiction is going to lead you to a choice to not 
believe in God. In other words, a choice to atheism. Now, here's a couple things that I thought about. That one is that this man is doomed to hell, probably. He's probably never been saved. I don't think he's saved. And he's going to go burn in hell, and he'll believe at that time. He won't be sorry because he's a rebel. He's made a choice of unbelief. But when he goes to hell, he'll go there, and it's a real shame. It's a shame that anybody goes to hell, friend. It's a real shame. Uh, and so that made me very sad. It really bothered me. I was looking at this man, and what made me upset was that he had been a part of an, of an organization that called itself Christ Church that had taught him evolution and caused him, because of the information that he was given, to draw natural conclusions that will lead him to hell. And that bothered me. I think it's a, it's a troubling thought that a man was under a ministry and led to believe in evolution. It bothered me. Now you say, Pastor, well, you know what? That's too bad. And uh, I don't know what you're all upset about. It. Here's the second thing that bothered me. second thing that bothered me was... On this interview with whatever news station it was, my thought was, what is going to happen to that man that believes that the Lord is going to come and take him up when it doesn't happen and he spent his fortune on it? I'll tell you what will probably happen is he will use his mind with bad information and draw conclusions that there's no God. With bad information, he'll draw conclusions that there's no God. I want to look at what the Bible has to say about it today, and I want to be able to help us to understand them and to understand our responsibility to them. In other words, understand the individuals that are wrong doctrinally and understand the, what, what our responsibility to them is. And so I think that this is a passage of Scripture that deals so well with it because it deals with the issue of this coming of Jesus. This is what 2 Peter chapter 3 is about. In verse 3, he says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust. The reason Peter says this to the church is because that is indeed what is happening in the last days. Friend, if you'll study the scripture, you'll come to understand that last days are the days after Jesus Christ ascended up into heaven. So when Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave a task to his church, and it was very simple. It is wait for the promise, which is the power of God's Holy Spirit, to preach the gospel. And when that happens, you preach the gospel everywhere until I come. That's the job of the church. That's the job of the Christian. To have the power of God's Spirit. By the way, there's nothing to wait for for us. Nothing to wait for. Anything we're waiting for isn't God. We're not waiting for God to do something. We're waiting for us to be what God wants us to be so we can have His power in our lives to do what He's called us to do. That is to preach the gospel. So that's the job of every Christian. Well, what had happened in the early church was that people came and said, Jesus is coming again. Well, where's He been? Now, keep in mind, it had only been you know, years here. 20 years or so. It's only been a certain amount of time and they're already saying, where's, his prom where's the promise of His coming? And 2 Peter chapter 3 explains why Jesus hasn't come yet. 2 Peter chapter 3 explains why Jesus has not yet come. But first of all, it identifies the scoffers and it says what their scoffing is. Now, this dear lady who was doing this interview, I hope she gets saved. I've prayed for her that she'd be saved. I don't remember her name, but I've just prayed for the person that did the interview. Her birthday was the next day, and she was concerned. She said, if my birthday comes tomorrow and doomsday comes tomorrow, obviously I'm probably not going up in the rapture, and so I'll get doomsday, and that's going to ruin my birthday. And she said, I really hope it doesn't happen because it's going to destroy my birthday. And afterward, a crowd of people that were in the, whatever they call the newsroom or whatever it is that were, she was corresponding with, they stood in a circle and sang Happy Doomsday to you. And uh, that's scoffing, by the way. That's making fun of something. That is a Bible truth, a Bible happening. I just thought, man, this is 2 Peter chapter 3. Christian, I want to tell you something. You need to understand why scoffers scoff. You need to understand why, and it's very plain, very apparent. And you know what the lady just summed it up and simply say, I don't want anything to ruin my birthday. In other words, I want my pleasure. I want to have it to be all about me, and I don't want it to be about God tomorrow. I don't want God to take his people out of the world and begin to judge me, the wicked, because I want to live for myself and I want to put that off. And they're scoffing and they're laughing and they're mocking about it. And the same was true of the Creation Museum people. They were like, well, you know, if you believe in that, then you've got to live this way, and you can't do this, and you can't do that, and boy, it's wonderful to be free from believing that there's a God who created the world and that you're responsible to obey. And the reason for it is because they want to live after the lust of their flesh. So I want us, first of all, this morning to understand the reason for scoffing. 
And the reason for scoffing is that it is so that individuals can walk after their own lust. In other words, they can do what their flesh wants instead of doing what God wants. You know, there are Christian scoffers. There are Christian scoffers. And they mock Bible principles and they mock Bible truth for the reason that they don't want to obey them and so they want to make light of them or make it seem as though it's not so in order that they can live for their flesh. And there's a warning, first of all, the Scripture. There's an explanation about those that are without. The scoffers that make fun of you. And Christian, I just want to tell you something. Don't be devastated because something didn't happen yesterday. You already knew it wasn't going to happen because the Bible said so. Now, I did personally think it'd be kind of funny if Jesus returned at 6 o'clock yesterday so that Harold Camping would have to stand before Jesus if he's saved or that he'd have to <laughs> deal with doomsday like he planned or like he talked about. I thought, man, you know what? Jesus can come anytime he wants to. Lord, or God can send Christ to come for us anytime he wants to. And he could do it when Harold Camping says so. And Harold Camping could have all his worshipers say, see, he's right. But he'll have to answer to God for it. See, it doesn't really matter. You know, I mean, people say, well, does his predicting, his prophesying the coming of Christ and saying he knows so, does that make it not happen? No, it doesn't at all. And it wouldn't, wouldn't prove anything if Christ had come yesterday. By the way, I planned on pausing at 6 o'clock yesterday and looking up. I planned on it. And I, I'm not being just silly about it. I'm just saying Jesus could have come yesterday. And I think it's good for us every now and again to stop and look up. That's not, that's not harmful because the Bible says He's going to come. He's going to. And I want to tell you something. Just because somebody who's a liar and a thief and a fraud is willing to fleece innocent people and steal from them, does not mean that something that the Bible teaches is not true. And here's the great danger of false doctrine. The great danger of false doctrine is somebody that believes the truth will believe it for the wrong reason. The consequence of it is so that they'll become an unbeliever when their expectations are not realized. So the great danger is those poor innocent people that have invested all their resources and all their money and they believe the lies. Harold Camping didn't believe the lies. I don't for one minute pretend to know his heart, but I'm just telling you, you look at the facts and you'll know he did not believe what he taught. You'll know he didn't believe it. It was just a plan to steal. It was a plan to take people's money. But you know, the sad part about it is all these billboards that he's been paying, uh, he hasn't been paying, but innocent people have been paying for, and you look at the money he's taken in versus what he's spent on billboards. I look at the billboards and think, man, they've spent a lot of money on billboards. It is nothing compared to what he's taken in as a result of his false teaching. But if you look at what he's done with these billboards, you know what they're going to say on him in a month's time? You, just, you mark my words. They're going to say there might not be a God. You know, this whole atheism movement. You see, Harold Camping has helped those scoffers. He has been a part of teaching people to mock something that is so true that individuals that are not prepared will be damned for eternity as a consequence of. See, friend, that's important. It's a big deal. It ought to matter to us. It ought to, ought to be something that we ought to say. That's not true! We need to tell people the truth! And God's Word says that Jesus Christ is coming, and scoffers don't make it not so, neither do liars. They're coming. Verse 4, the, the, here's their question. Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. This is an agnostic speaking here. Yeah, there might be a God, but He's not involved with anything, and it doesn't matter. It's a scoffing agnostic. In verse 6, Whereby, here's the answer to it, for this they willingly are ignorant of. Now let me just say this. Here's your answer. Listen, friend. It may be that because of the hype of the media, and of course, by the way, the media has been pretty kind about it, honestly. For lost people, they've been pretty unbiased about it. They have at least reported that there are Christians who can show from the Bible that what Harold Camping is saying is not so. I appreciate that. I'm surprised that they've done it because usually what they do is they just mock Christianity, but they've done both. They've mocked Christianity and then said there is another, there is another side to the story. They don't spend much time on the other side of the story, but they do admit it. And so I appreciate that, and I'm glad that they at least know that. That's good journalism to report on both sides of, the, of it. And so the, I don't blame the media for this whole thing. It's, it's not their hype. They're not the one that's made it big. It's, anyway, we don't want to get too much into that because we don't want to give credit where credit isn't due, but it's thieves and liars. But the Bible says about people that don't believe that they are willingly ignorant. Willingly is a volitional statement. In other words, it's a choice. It is something that someone has done because they've wanted to. Literally what it means is that a person wanted to be ignorant and did so happily. So it's uh, the, the blissful ignorance idea. In other words, I'm happy to not know the truth. 
And here's the explanation for why individuals don't want to believe that Jesus is coming. First of all, they don't want to believe that God made the world. <laughs> Look at what 2 Peter 3 says. You say evolution's a new concept. No, it's just the best um, articulation of unbelief for quite a while. In other words, other people said, well, I don't believe in the flood, but they didn't, have, they didn't come up with an alternative to it. So evolution is an alternative to explain what is, if you've just got eyes and ears and a brain, very, very obvious, and that was that the world was destroyed by a flood. I mean, it's just obvious that the world was destroyed by a flood. Go on the top of a mountain in, in the Colorado Rockies and explain to me why fish bones are up there and fossilized in rock. Uh, it, it wasn't millions and millions of years. It's just common sense. It was underwater and under a lot of water and a lot of pressure and amazing things happened. There was a worldwide flood. But individuals are willingly ignorant of that. Now they pick an alternative today, so they're, they're very sophisticated in their unbelief, in that not only do they happily make a choice to not believe the truth, but they've picked an alternative to it to believe instead. Now that's, that's sophisticated stupidity. And that's like, you know, where you, you miss the obvious and really believe something ridiculous as a result of it, and boy, it doesn't take a lot of intelligence to do that, although they think they're very intelligent, they worship their intellects. The fact of the matter is they're very sophisticated in their stupidity. And I don't know any kinder way to say it than that or any more unkind way. That's just the way it is, and so I hope you like it. Um, this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So they're willingly ignorant of the flood, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. So they deny the worldwide flood. That's ridiculous. Verse 7, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word, okay, by the word that destroyed the world in a flood, that same word is the word that is keeping these things by in store, in other words, preserving them from judgment. By the same word are kept in store, in other words, being reserved unto fire unto the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Here's the sad thing of the willing ignorance or the sophisticated stupidity is that it'll burn in hell. See, uh, these things are being reserved, being preserved. You ever see the brat that doesn't have the brains to know who he's messing with? You ever see a kid, you know, and he'll mess with somebody that's very nice. They always mess with nice people. You ever notice that? The, and we call it bullying today, and there's this whole bullying thing, and it, it's gotten really silly what they call bullying. Usually it means that you have an intolerance for wickedness, but they uh, call it bullying today. But, you know, the kid that messes with you and just keeps messing and messing and messing and messing. He messes with a guy that can pound him. Matter of fact, there's a YouTube video Brother Kent likes, and it's of uh, this boy that's pretty husky, and this little kid, like, taunting him and, like, poking him and punching him and punching him. And, and really, and he finally slaps the kid in the face or something like that. I don't remember. Brother Kent could give you the details. But he punches the kid in the face. And this bigger husky boy grabs him, turns him upside down, and body slams him head first. I mean, he throws him down. Not just puts him down. He throws him down on the ground. The kid kind of gets up like this, you know. And here he is. He's messing with somebody that has the ability to pound him. And the boy's just kind of like, you know, just leave me alone. Leave me alone. There, there's three little bullies there picking on the big kid. And finally, the big kid pounds him. He just throws him down. This is the way it is with scoffers and God on a much larger scale. Whereas here are people saying, I thought the rapture was going to happen. Where's God? I want to tell you something. God is. And it's unbelievable that he has not destroyed them by fire. And there is a doctrine in 2 Peter chapter 3 that every Christian ought to know thoroughly because of personal experience and because of God's attitude toward the lost. And that's the doctrine of long-suffering. Christian, if you have any opportunity like you've never had it before, this week you have the opportunity to tell people that God is long-suffering. There is willing, willful Ignorance. And people say, well, how can I believe Jesus hasn't returned? How can I believe? Friend, how can you not believe? Just because God is good, just because God is merciful, is not proof that He does not exist. That's nonsense. That's ridiculous. And you know, I think there are Christians who've had their faith shaken this week. Individuals that know that Jesus Christ is their Savior, that He died for them, that He became sin for them, 
They've had their faith shaken, and even some of them destroyed this week. And it's nonsense. We ought to thoroughly understand the reason Jesus did not come back last night. We ought to understand it. The reason is because God is preserving the world for hell. You, you know what's going to happen with this earth? You know what the future of this earth is? You know what the future of the old heavens is? It's going to be destroyed by fire. You know where, where the future of the scoffers is? They're going to be cast into hell with the devil. By the way, be reminded, I know you know this, but the devil's not in hell today. He's not in hell. He's the prince of the power of the air in this world. And he's very, very pleased by his minion, Harold Camping. Very pleased with him. Because he has helped to sow unbelief. He's helped to destroy Christians. And he's helped to sow seeds of doubt with individuals that might have believed. Let me answer the question 2 Peter chapter 3 deals with. First of all, it says, time's not the issue. Look at verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That's a nice word. Ignorant is probably kinder than what did I say a little bit? Sophisticated stupidity. Uh, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. God's not impatient in His mercy. And for that, I'm very glad. Aren't you? Christian, when is the time that you ever sinned and God instantly destroyed you? If that were God's way of dealing with His people, first of all, you wouldn't have survived yesterday. Or the day before. Or the day before that. Or every day since the day you were saved, God would have destroyed you every day. If it were not for His long-suffering mercy and for the fact that it, he's patient. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. In other words, it doesn't mean God doesn't con understand time. There's this thing about eternity that people say, well, God doesn't see time. You know, he sees things on a flat. You just knock that out. God created time and he understands it thoroughly. But the fact is, is that God's long-suffering is not on a timer. God's long-suffering is something that is so vast and so measureless that we can't comprehend it. But it's something that you ought to pound into your head and believe. I tell Christians all the time, listen, friend, take advantage of 1 John 1, 9. I know Christians say, oh, it's not right just to sin and confess your sin and then go back into sin and confess your sin. You know, I'm just not even going to live for Jesus because I can't live it. Friend, I want to tell you something. It's wonderful that God forgives sin even for a person who's already been saved. It's wonderful that God is a long-suffering God of second, third, fourth, 70 times 7 times 7 times 7 chances. You can't number, you can't measure the infinite mercy of God in heaven. You ought to comprehend that on a personal level. And you ought to preach it to the lost. Jesus didn't come yesterday. I want to stand on the balcony out here and scream, Jesus didn't come yesterday because he doesn't want you to go to hell. Amen. That's why he didn't come. Amen. That's why Jesus didn't come yesterday, because He wants you to be ready for Him at His coming, and because He doesn't want to burn the lost for eternity. He wants them to be saved. He will have all men to be saved and to come into knowledge. You ought to understand that, Christian. You ought to preach it. Harold Camping wouldn't have a chance if we preached the gospel like we ought to, to sow false doctrine. You know why Harold Camping can talk about false doctrine? Because people are hungry. They want to hear something. They want to know something. And they're not hearing the preaching of the truth of the Word of God from the people that ought to know it. They ought to know about mercy and long-suffering from people like you that know by personal experience and from knowing the Scripture. They ought to know because of us. And that ought to bring you a little bit of a heaviness and a sense of duty and responsibility. What about your co-workers? Have you just joked about it or have you told them God is long-suffering? Now, there's different individuals. I think it was the professor Biola university he might have been the one that said he didn't think any good had come about out of this whole thing but a couple of uh, evangelical uh, professors have been interviewed about the thing and asked their opinion about what if jesus doesn't come what's that going to do to christianity and one said it's not going to do anything good at all it's going to be very very harmful to the cause of christ another one said well um you know it's going to bring up the subject so that people think about it and dialogue with it and they might arrive at truth well that could be true that's the whole concept of you know be like the world 
so that you can reach the world. In other words, uh, bartender uh, evangelism. You know, belly up to the bar and drink with the drunkards so that they'll know you're just like them and they can relate to you and you can win them. Well, has anyone ever been saved that way? I've actually met people that have. <laughs> I have. But I just want to tell you something. God hates it. And, and God's mercy to that person is not because of a scoffer who is a believer. God's mercy to that person is because he's, he's just so infinitely merciful, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable how merciful God is. Let's get this. I need to finish because you folks are tired of me talking. You're ready to go to sleep. So let's finish up. <laughs> the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now when's it going to come? Well, it's going to come when they don't know it. And the Holy Spirit's not going to tell anybody. He's already told us enough to be ready. What did he say? We're not, we're not in the dark. We're not in darkness that that day should overtake us as a thief. That's not us as Christians. We ought to be living in the light. We ought to be walking in the light. And we won't be like the individuals that miss the rapture and come under judgment. But Harold Camping was right in that judgment would come. See, this is the bad part. Uh, there's two things that are, that are happening. First of all, post-millennialism is really getting a boost from missing the rapture yesterday. Obviously, the rapture didn't happen, so you know it doesn't exist. Friend, because God did not come yesterday doesn't mean, doesn't mean He can't. But here's what would happen if that were true. The earth would be dissolved. <laughs> the Bible says, The heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That's mentioned in the, Revelation, in the book of Revelation with the timeline for when it's going to happen, by the way, chronologically. The world's going to get burned up. God's going to burn it. Uh, don't you worry about it. He'll get it done. But the good thing about it is he doesn't, he's, he's withholding his wrath. He's right, to, he's right to judge, but he's withholding judgment because he's infinitely merciful. And you understand that anybody here uh, today, does anyone here know that God is infinitely merciful? In an unbelievable way. Unbelievable way. Nevertheless, we, and so here's our attitude, here's our conclusion. Now here's what we're supposed to do. We, in other words, we're not the ones that are following Harold Camping. We're not the ones who are scoffing, walking after the lust of our flesh and saying, where's the promise of his coming? It's us, the ones who know what the Bible says and believe God. We, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. You know what your response ought to be to the lost? Look for a new heaven, look for a new earth. Hey, folks, things are going to get better. I want to tell you something. For a Christian, we literally can have, having the things that pertain to life and godliness, according to 2 Peter in chapter 1, this very book we're studying today, we can really have it good here on this earth. Literally for a Christian who's in fellowship with the Lord, life living for Jesus is heaven on earth. You say, Pastor, my life's hell. There's something wrong with you, but there's nothing wrong with the way Jesus saved you, and there's nothing wrong with the life that He called you to live for Him. He's equipped you, He's given you the divine nature, and He's equipped you with the things so that you could have the things that pertain to life and godliness. And you read down the list of the things you're supposed to add to your faith, and that's why you think life's hell. It's because you're a lousy Christian, not because God didn't save you well, and because He didn't give you a good life. you got a bad attitude, you better correct it. Because why? Because we are looking. We're supposed to be looking for a new heaven, a new earth, and the way to look is to be ready. There's nothing wrong with anyone yesterday looking up at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock, or 8 o'clock, or 5 o'clock, or 2 o'clock, or whenever you want to look up. Friend, that's the attitude of a believer, looking up. Amen. We are looking for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, here's the conclusion. Seeing that we look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. You know what your response to last week's debauchery and nonsense ought to be? Righteous living. Righteous living. Without blame. Him. Listen, once you have a testimony that's different than the money-grubbing thieves, you ought to have a testimony that's, that's a, in contrast to that. And there ought to be some kindness towards you. Listen, you, you ought to be angry with somebody that mocks creation, that mocks the coming of Jesus Christ. Friend, you ought to be, have the mind of God toward them, and that is long-suffering. Listen, they're, they're little, little taunters. They're little bullies. Trying to say, God, why don't you come? Why don't you destroy me? Unfortunately, he might have to. But it will not be because he's not long-suffering. Here's why. An account, verse 15, that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Now I want to remind you about something. What were you before you came to Christ? What were you before you became, became a Christian, before you got saved? You were a scoffer, walking after your own lust, saying, where's the promise of his coming? That's what you were. Oh, pastor, I never, I, you know, I was, always, I was always afraid. I always had respect for God. 
You know, I didn't mess with God. And there are people that have res respect in some ways for spiritual things. I remember one time when I was in Christian college and I was traveling home over the Christmas break and I, I w was driving through Shreveport, Louisiana and I needed gas and I pulled over and I wasn't by myself. There was another car that was with us, but I was driving by myself in my uh, pickup and a uh, car pulled up next to me with uh, some interesting sounds coming from it like it was a jungle or something inside it and it was thumping and shaking and so forth and the people driving it shut it off and one of them got out of the driver's seat and came around to me he pulled up kind of blocked my car in next to the gas pump and he, he came up next to me and I at that time looked around I thought you know what this doesn't look like the best neighborhood and I noticed there's nobody else around here <laughs> maybe I shouldn't be either and so I drew that conclusion pretty quickly and it really asked the Holy Spirit for help and uh, the <laughs> Uh, he pulled up next to my to my car, and his hood was kind of by my hood. And he said, hey, man, my car won't start. Can I get a jump? Well, he shut it off, and he had noise coming from it that showed that it had some electrical power to it <laughs> of some sort. And so, obviously, it wasn't true. He was going to mug me. And while he was saying that, uh, two other guys came up behind me. And I said, sure, I'd be glad to give you a jump. And fortunately, I had a tract in my front pocket. And I handed it to him. I said, you know, I'm a Christian. And I go to, I told him the Christian college that I went to, and uh, said, you know, um, I'm studying for ministry, and I want to tell you about Jesus. Amen. And man, he goes like this. Amen. He put his hands up while he's surrendering, and he reached in his pocket, and he pulled out a roll of $100 bills. I mean, a big roll of $100 bills, and he starts peeling them off. And he's like, here, let me give you something. And he's trying to give me an offer. I thought I didn't preach the gospel yet. And let's take up an offer. Well, this happened. These guys, they all back away and get in the car. And, um, and I, gave, I gave each of them a tract and told them about Jesus. And he said, let me give you some money. I said, no, I don't want your money. I don't need money. And um, so they, they went to leave. I said, well, let me jump your car. And they said, oh, now I think it'll start. And they got in and they got out of there. Why? Well, because even though they perhaps, maybe they were saved and were in sin, I don't know, but they had some sort of a respect for God in a sense. You know something I learned when I go into real bad neighborhoods to witness? I wear a suit for two reasons. One, they either think I'm a parole officer or an undercover agent or, or they think I'm a preacher. And any of those will keep me safe usually under most circumstances. And so you don't want to mess with a PO, and you don't want to mess with, uh, <laughs> you, you just, uh, you, you don't mess with those guys, but you sure don't mess with God because you're not living right. Amen. And there are people that aren't living right, and they know it, and you know what they need? They need to hear about long-suffering. They need to hear about God's mercy and the fact that God wants them to be saved, that they can't live for Jesus, and that they would despair if they ever tried. It would be hopeless, but that because of what Jesus Christ can do for them, they can experience God's grace in their life, and they ought to see it in yours. You ought to be a testimony of it. You ought to not just live it. You ought to proclaim it. You ought to proclaim truth. Hey, listen, there's all kind of individuals proclaiming their scoffing. There are all kind of individuals proclaiming doctrinal error. What about the truth? What about the truth? If anything good comes out of last week, it won't be because, it won't be because of Harold Camping. It'll be because God's Spirit got a hold of believers and convicted us about sin. It caused us to preach the truth. And Verse 15 says, Account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. I wanted to preach two points today, so I'll tell you what the second point is. First of all, the first reason individuals are ignorant is because they're scoffers and they willingly make a choice of unbelief. But the second reason for ignorance is pragmatic theology. What do I mean by that? You know what pragmatic means? It means you do it because it's practical. And that's, that's usually what the church does today. They do what's practical. They say, well, the Bible's a very impractical book. Instead of doing what the Bible says, we'll do it this way because it's better. And that's where you have a program-centered church comes from, a church that says this is how you reach people. People don't like to hear preaching. Baloney, I like preaching, don't you? Mm -hmm. Hey, you know what? You got saved because you needed to, and other people will too. We have bought into this world's lie that God's way doesn't work. And by the way, that's why God's way isn't working, because we're not working His way. We're working man's way. And we've got all the programs, we've got the Sunday schools, we've got all the things to attract people and to bring them in. And we think that success is a crowd. I'll tell you something, success can bring a crowd. But I'll tell you what success is, truth being proclaimed with God's power. And there are people that like that. You know why a lot of lost people don't want to get saved? Because they think it's a joke, because they've seen you. I don't mean to be unkind to you uh, this morning, but isn't that a fact sometimes? They don't see God's power in your life, and they have reason to be skeptical about it. But it doesn't mean it's not true. So we need to live for Jesus so that people can know. The second thing that happens with pragmatic theology is the Scripture says they rest with the Scripture. You know what that means? 
means they take the Word of God and wrestle it or they pin it into position. It carries with the idea of a wrestler. What's a wrestler try to do? Tries to take his opponent and put him where he doesn't want to go. Right? On his shoulders, usually. Wants to pin him. Wants to pin him down. You know, that's what most people do with the Bible. They take what they want to believe and they try to pin the Bible to make it say it. They rest with the Scriptures. Instead of going to the Bible and saying, God, put me where you want me. Move me how you want me. Instead of the Scriptures taking us and putting us where we ought to be, we take the Scriptures and run them through our theology. We filter them through our theology. That's where Calvinism, Arminianism, that's where all these false doctrines come from. They take a systematic theology and they systemize the Scripture and they wrestle the Scripture to go where they want it to. And that's where Harold Camping got his stuff. Now, he didn't really claim much scripture. He just said the Holy Spirit told him. He blasphemed God's Holy Spirit. And uh, God will deal with him. I'm not, I'm not concerned about that at all. It's not my problem. But there are innocent people that need to hear the gospel this week. So what are you going to do? Do you know why Jesus didn't come yesterday? Because God's long-suffering and you ought to tell people about it. Because he wants all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. He's a really good God. Hey, listen, is your faith shaken or is it strengthened from the Scripture? You won't have your faith strengthened by listening to scoffers and by listening to people that claim to know something that God says you can't know. But it'll be strengthened if you go into the Word of God and find out the truth. And the truth is that Jesus didn't come yesterday because God's long-suffering and gives us the chance to be prepared and gives us the chance to preach the truth. So what are you going to do? Heavenly Father, help us to respond to your Word, to your message the way that we ought to. And Lord, I, it wouldn't be my desire at all today to try to be something because of false doctrine or because of what somebody else is wrong about. But Lord, it is so vital, so important for us to know you and know why it is that you didn't come yesterday and know why it is that you've let and you've withheld judgment. Thank you for being merciful to me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to repent. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to come into fellowship. And I ask that you'd help us, each of us to realize this truth. And Lord, I ask that you would give us the opportunity to combat false doctrine so that individuals could come to Jesus Christ. God, we don't need to expose, we don't need to expose heresy and lies. that They've exposed themselves. But Lord, we ask that you be merciful to these poor individuals that are victims of lies and help them not to take bad information and draw wrong conclusions. But instead, God, I ask that in your mercy, you would point them to the truth. And God, I ask that you would privilege us to be allowed to be a help in that area. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I know we've gone a long time this morning, and I, I can't say I'm sorry for that. You've got a job to do, and you've got to get it done. But uh, I want to ask, we're going to have an invitation at this time in our church, and I'll explain that to you in just a second. I'll just ask if everyone stand to your feet, and take your hymn books, and go to page 242. Let me explain what the invitation is this morning. The invitation is a time when we would invite you, if God spoke to you today, if God showed you truth here today, for you to respond to it. Now, it might be you would say today, you know what, there's nothing to respond to. God just changed my thinking about something. Well, friend, you know what you ought to do if God changed your thinking about something? You ought to say, you know what, God, thank you for showing me that. And this is what I'm going, how I'm going to live as a result of it. You ought to commit it to Him. And so that's what the invitation is, really. It's a time when you could respond to what God says. God doesn't talk so we can say God's talking. God speaks to us so that we can hear, and if we hear, what happens? Well, we change. So he talked to us so we could change. And the invitation's a time when you could just uh, do business with the Lord. It may be that you're sitting here today, and in your seat you made a decision. You said, you know what, I'm going to change this in my life. Or God, hey, you know, it's amazing. God's Spirit convicts us about things when His Word is preached. And He just says, you know what, this doesn't belong in your life, or that doesn't belong. Or it might be you're here this morning, and you've never received Jesus as your Savior, and you've been a bit of a scoffer. And you said, well, you know what, I, I don't understand you know, I think that there, there's evolution, and I just don't understand there could be God. Friend, don't be willingly ignorant. Just look at the obvious. There's a God. God told you so. Uh, he's speaking to you today. His Holy Spirit's talking to your heart, and that's real, and you can't deny it. And so I would say to you this morning, receive Jesus as your Savior. Just don't, don't be a big shot. Don't try to be smarter than God. Uh, trust Jesus Christ for your salvation. You know it's so, and I can't prove it to you. I don't have to. God's spoken to you, and you should respond in the invitation regarding the matter of your salvation. You're here this morning, and God spoke to you. We just invite you. We've got some benches up front, and you could come forward, and you shouldn't be ashamed to go and do business with God and be a testimony to other individuals or to say, God's spoken to me, and He's done a work in my heart. You could kneel right where you're at. 
But I would invite you during invitation, don't waste what God's told you today. You respond, you do business with him. We're going to sing page 242. As we sing, Jesus, I come, you come, if God's spoken to your heart. <laughs>